You're listening to the audio version of a message from Annistown Row Church. Grab your Bible, hold it up, and repeat after me. This is my Bible. This is my Bible. The Word of God. And inside, God tells me the plans he has for my life. He tells me how much he loves me, even when this world tells me that I am not lovable. And I shall be all that God desires for me to be because his Holy Spirit dwells inside of me. This I proclaim. In Jesus' name, name. amen, amen, Amen. Amen. and amen. Amen. If you don't mind, turn your attention to 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. For a few weeks, uh, we're going to uh, look at a few places in the Bible, uh, a few accounts, a few uh, recorded facts, stories, that are just kind of weird, you know? Like some weird things that took place in the Bible, but just because it's weird doesn't mean it's not real. It's weird because it's, you're gonna see some miracles displayed. It's weird because it's different, it's unique, but it took place. And this is one of those particular places here in 2 Kings uh, chapter 6. And here in 2 Kings chapter 6, cha- uh, verse, beginning at verse 1 through 7, it says, Now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, Behold, now the place before you where we are living is too limited for us. Please let us go to the Jordan and each of us take from there a beam and let us make a place there for ourselves where we may live. So he said, go. Then one said, please be willing to go with your servants. And he answered, I shall go. So he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried out and said, Alice, my master, for it was borrowed. Then the man of God said, where did it fall? And when he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. He said, take it up for yourself. So he put out his hand and took it. And for a little while, we're just going to talk about acts away, acts away. Um, This is a unique passage um, because it teaches us that we must always adjust our perspective. And one of the things that we mistakenly do is sometimes we can get captivated and caught in material things around us. We can get caught up in carnal things around us. We can get caught up uh, in the items and things and, uh, that take place on a day-to-day basis, uh, but sometimes we neglect one of the greatest treasures of all, and that is the very presence of God. Because whether things are happening in your my life that is pleasing to us or that is not pleasing to us or things that cause pain or things that cause comfort, one thing that is needed is the presence of God. So whether I'm having a, a, a moment on the mountaintop, I want the presence of God. Amen. If I'm in the valley, I want the presence of God. Amen. And sometimes there's a greater desire for the Lord's presence when we are in the valley. But God's presence presence is a present at all times. The greatest thing that a person can have going on in their life 
is the presence of God. If you ever came out on Christmas morning and there were no presents under the tree, it does not mean that God is not present. We desire for God to be present. If a marriage is having, a, if, if, if they're having a, a difficult time in a marriage, uh, and, and even if a person is stepping in and out, the consistent person that one desires to be there is God's presence. Because even in a situation like that, there still can be peace. If you work in a workplace where it is hostile, it's not a place known for peace, uh, there's fighting uh, and, and there's turmoil there. Uh, one, even in all of that turmoil and that chaos, there should be a desire for the presence of God because even in the midst of all of this hostility around us, we can have peace because of the presence of God. And wherever God is present, there can be peace and there can be power because he is present. Well, one of the things that we sometimes neglect is that when we are going through big things in life, choosing, making decisions about things that uh, we believe are, 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 are have a will have a massive um, outtake on our life. We sometimes seek the Lord. If someone loses a job, oftentimes they want to hear from the Lord. But let me tell you, do you know God cares about even the smallest thing that take place in your and my life? There is nothing in your and my life that God does not want and desire to be a part of. And he wants you and I to have a desire for him to be a part of our life. So let's look at what we can gain from 2 Kings chapter 6. In verse 1, we see the dilemma. It says, now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, Behold, now the place before you where we are living is too limited for us. Let's just look at this. First of all, it says the sons of the prophet. Uh, this is a prophetic community. Sons of would be uh, um, basically the school of or the community of prophets. And this was a school of or community of prophets. And this was during a time where Israel was in spiritual decline and moral uh, decline. Uh, and a lot of them were being taken away and falling into op op uh, 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 false teaching because of um, Queen Jezebel and King Ahab misleading them and taking them further away. And many of the Israelites were falling victim to it and being taken away from following and respecting the law of Moses and honoring God. And so they were falling into worship of Baal and uh, other false, false um, uh, uh, worship. Uh, and they were lost in this idolatry of worshiping these false gods. And so you have the sons of God who trace back many, many years. The sons or, or, or the, this community or this family or this uh, of prophets, they would be led by leaders and mentors such as Elijah, Elisha, great prophets, uh, even Samuel the prophet because they went all the way back to Samuel the prophet and they were being raised up and schooled and taught uh, so that they could help preserve the law of Moses and further God's truth. And so they were being raised up. And so you have these sons of God, and they're in this uh, area in Jericho, and they come to Elisha. Elisha succeeded Elijah. Uh, Elisha was one of the greatest uh, prophets that the Old Testament talks about. In fact, uh, Elisha, uh, he was one of the very few people that was called a man of God. Out of 13 people called the man of God in the Old Testament, Elisha and Elijah were two of them. There's only one person mentioned as a man of God or as the man of God in the New Testament. That was Timothy. 
under uh, when Paul called him that. And so Elisha was one of 13 people called a man of God. And remember, a prophet and uh, represented or he spoke on behalf of God to the people and spoke on behalf of the people to God. That was his role. So he was a man of God and he represented God. And so during his time period of his ministry, 845 to 800 BC, uh, he was widely known. And so the sons of prophets or this school of prophets that would learn from him. And by the way, it was over it was over hundreds of them, because even early on, uh, I can't remember the chapter now, but there's a, a where it mentions a hundred of them many years prior. They had continued to grow there in Jericho, which is a beautiful thing. S their dilemma where they say, hey, watch this. Um, they said to Elisha, behold, now the place before you where we are living is too limited for us. It sounds like a bad problem, but it's a good problem because the school of prophets or this community of prophets, and, and, and it uses the term son to show the relationship that they have with the mentor. It was growing so much, one out of the need in Israel, the spiritual need. That was a spiritual need because of the great decline. Um, and so one, the school was growing out of that. Two, it was growing uh, simply because God was stretching it. And so they became so many that they were running out of space. And so they needed more room. A change had to happen. Now, it's funny. A church, a local church, can have a difficult time about making any change, even though change has to be made for the areas of the things that are taking place. But oftentimes churches refuse to change, so sometimes a church can put something in place and they believe what they're doing or the method in what they're doing is the only way to do it. When the objective is, uh, is the message going forth. The me listen, that's the object. The objective is for people to hear the gospel. The method on how things are done, it, it, listen, it can change. You can't change the message because God gave us the message. But he gives the church wisdom to change the methods on how things get done so that the message can continue to go forth. The reason why this is so important is because the area, even here in Gwinnett, is not the same as it was in 1982 when this church was planted. It's not the same as 2002, nor is it the same of 2015. In fact, COVID brought in a whole lot of change. And so one must be willing to make adjustments on method. For instance, if I wanted to send Dennis Brown a letter, but I also wanted to send Brother Hodges a letter, but I also needed to send Brother Glenn a letter, and I also wanted to send Miss Maddie a letter, I could go into my office and type a letter, and it's the same message I need to get to them all, I can type four letters that are saying the same thing, and I can put them in an envelope and mail it to each of them, and it says the same thing. Or I could have sat down at a computer, wrote an email, put all of their names in the recipient box, and pressed the send button. I could have typed it four times, or I could have did an email one time. And listen, I know the post service, they got some places that move faster than others, still doesn't move faster than email, as long as a person opens up the email. It's still the same communication, but the method change. Does it make it any less? Or No, it's the method change. 
they had to evolve and they had to grow because the decline was growing. And God will grow a church spiritually, physically, and financially to respond to the massive mess that is around us. He will first grow the church spiritually. There are people in this church, listen, I have seen you grow from what I knew of you just a year ago or three years ago. And I know that is not for want. God is doing that because God has greater plans to respond to the massive mess around you and I. So God will raise up people and local churches to respond to various things and places all around the world. And that's because God is a loving God and God utilizes his people to be the hands and the feet. This was the dilemma that they were in, but it's a good thing that they're asking for. What they say is, we need to leave here. This place is too tight. It's too many of us. We need more room. We have to get out of here. We have to, listen, we, we need a greater capacity. Our band is being stretched. That was the dilemma that they were in. Um, here's the thing. Paul was the mentor of Timothy and Titus and many others. Paul, God used Paul to raise up others, and in return, those others were to raise up others. It should be ever growing. In a local church such as this, it's not enough for you to be discipled. You must disciple. It's not enough for you to be taught. You must teach. It's not enough for you to simply disciple. It's not enough for you to simply teach. The person that you discipled and that you taught must disciple and they must teach. Amen. There's no end to it. That's how ministry gets accomplished. That was the dilemma. But watch the decision. They say, let us go to the Jordan. The Jordans was just, uh, Jordan River was just east of Jericho where they were. And each of us take from there a beam and let us make a place there for ourselves where we may live. And so they had this area, this, uh, it was a significant location uh, in Israel's history, as you have heard probably many times about the Jordan River. Uh, and they had to cross this river to enter into the promised land. Uh, uh, it was known for a place of uh, healing and miracles and uh, fights took place all around that area. So it's a very historic setting. Uh, in fact, uh, Elisha, his ministry was always marked by miracles. Elisha, on uh, a previous occasion to chapter six, I believe it's chapter five or chapter four, but he ministered to Naaman. Naaman was the captain of the uh, uh, Syrian army and Naaman had this, uh, Naaman was a Syrian himself, so he was a foreigner, uh, so he was not a Jew, but he had this Jewish female slave and Naaman was sick with leprosy, and this female Jewish slave says, man, if only he knew or could meet or could go to uh, Elisha, the man of God. And the word got out, the king of Syria sent a letter uh, and sent the captain of the Syrian force, Naaman, down to see Elisha, but Elisha gave directions for uh, Naaman to go to the Jordan River and dip himself in it seven times. 
a Naaman went off. He was not happy that Elisha did not come out and speak to him personally and tell him to go to some rivers that he thought were uh, uh, greater rivers with greater waters and whatnot. And he said, that's, that's greater waters than the Jordan River. So he was complaining about it and whatnot. And uh, he was rebuked by some others. And he eventually dipped himself in the Jordan River. And he did it seven times. When he came out on the seventh time, he was completely healed. Healed to the fact so much that the Bible said that his skin was like that of a child. And he decried, he made it known, he, he acknowledged, he surrendered, he confessed that all of these gods that we worship here in Syria, they are, listen, there is no God like the one true living God. So he acknowledged the one true living God. Elisha's ministry was marked by miracles such as this. And now you get to see the great thing that this school of prophets recognized. It says, they said, let us go to the Jordan. And each of us take a beam and let us make a place there for ourselves to live. One of the things that they want to take and build uh, 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 and take care of housing and um, uh, a setup for themselves. They were willing to put in the work. Now, these are a bunch of prophets and preachers. All right, these are not mechanics. They're not carpenters, but they're willing to do the work for themselves. And so the, uh, the idea here is they're willing to put their hands in the weeds and get their hands dirty also. And so here they are saying, let us go down, let us get some beams, let us get to work, uh, let us set up us a, a, a setting where we can live and do ministry from. And also because they would be close to the Jordan River, they would still have some proximity to Jericho. And so they would continue to grow from that particular uh, geographical location. And so here they are getting ready to get to work. But notice what they say. Notice what they say here in verse two. They says, a place there for ourselves where we may go. So he said, that is Elisha, Elisha said, go. I'm cool, I'm cool with it. Y'all go ahead. But then in verse three it says, then one said, Please be willing to go with your servants. See, it's not enough to ask God to give you a new job. God, give me a new job and be with me when you give me that new job. It's not enough to marry someone and ask God to bless the wedding and help you enter into a relationship with the person that you have eyes for and they have eyes for you. It's not enough to ask God on the front end, but God, be with me when I come down to the altar and take his hand. God, be with me when the preacher stands before us and we say, I do, be with us there. But Lord, when we turn and walk away from that altar, and we go back to our living space. Be with us. Lord, be with us when we sit on the couch and play chess. When we look at TV, be with us when we go on vacation. Lord, be with us when we raise kids. Lord, be with us even when we are upset with each other and argue with each other. Be with us. It's not enough to just simply have the power to send me, but you be with me. It's not enough to say, Lord, would you increase my income? Give me a raise. One has to turn around and say, Lord, now when you give me the raise, be with me. Give me the wisdom on how to manage it, how to operate it, because it's still yours. I'm still just a steward. So whether I was making $50 and now I'm making $60, the $10 more that you give me, be with me just as with this 60 as much as you were with me when I had the 50. But watch this, Lord, if my $60 turns to 
Be with me. Be with me, Lord, as I raise up these kids. But Lord, be with me when my kids leave. Lord, also be with me as the kids are with me. In other words, when they listen, but also be with me when they don't listen. Be with me. It's not enough just to have power to do something. They were empowered to go and do something by Elisha. Elisha, once again, a representative of God. They were not just, they didn't just want it to be empowered. One was wise enough to turn around and say, listen, you have empowered us, but could you also be present with us? Because listen, I'll mess up this situation if you just give me power. People with power do damage in the lives of other people when God is not present. If you have authority, if you have been empowered, if you have been equipped with something, you also need God's presence so that you can be wise with it and manage it well. So he said, would you go with us there? And Elisha said, I shall go. I shall go. I will be with you. Think about this. If someone said to you, hey, and they were a multi-millionaire, and they said, what do you want from me? You get two requests. Well, if you were to ask for money, your second request, and this is how, I, listen, this is what I would do. If J.C. Gay had 10 million, he said, Joe, what would you like? I said, I like, you got two requests. He said, well, I like a million dollars. What's your second request? I want your wisdom and your guidance on what I need to do with this million dollars. Now you say, why would I ask him that? Why don't I try to go and figure it out? Why do I have to go and figure it out? If this man has made $10 million, it would be naive to take a million dollars and not ask the one who knows how to make $10 million. He, he, listen, it, it doesn't even make any sense. The knowledge can actually, listen, if you have $10, you can do a lot more with $10 with wisdom than someone, than a fool with $100. But that's another message. <laughs> um, um, so, so they asked for him to be present. So that Elijah made a decision to go with them. And um, I, I, I want you to think about something. When you invite God into your life to direct even the small things, it's going to make it so much easier when it comes to the big thing. I'm, I'm telling you, don't just seek him for the big things. Seek him out for the small things. So whether it comes to work or home or whatever it may be, Seek him, seek him out. Uh, one of the things I have learned in ministry, you can have some of the most brilliant strategies, but strategies to be executed well require leadership. Leadership require temperament. And so sometimes a leader may have a strategy and it's best for him or her not to even communicate that there's a strategy at all until he or she is prepared to communicate, navigate, and manage that particular strategy. And if he or she cannot manage it well, then uh, the most brilliant strategy will look foolish. Uh, so that, that was the dilemma, that was a decision, and, uh, and of course, uh, Elijah, Elisha went with them, and notice this right here. That's in verses three, um, two through uh, Three, and then in verse four it says, so he went, he went with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. Now, once again, I need y'all to remember, these are not 
Listen, these are not uh, carpenters. These are not people who are accustomed to cutting down trees. Uh, and so verse 5 says, but as one was felling a beam, cutting down a tree, cutting uh, the axe head fell into the water. And by the way, the axe head, uh, axe was a very precious tool. And an axe head would be um, similar to a tractor. That's how valuable it was. Iron was very valuable, and having it shaped and molded was uh, uh, very expensive. And so the axe head fell into the water, and he cried out and said, Alice, oh my, what am I going to do? My master, for it was borrowed. And so it not only is an expensive piece of equipment, but it doesn't even belong to him. And the law of Moses says that if one lost or damaged someone else's property, they either had to replace it or they had to compensate for it with interest. And these are not men of wealth. They don't have good financial means. And, uh, and of course, once again, you know, he's broken the tool because he probably don't even know what he's doing. Uh, and, uh, but imagine someone letting you use their car and, uh, the transmission goes out while you're driving it, while you're driving it. And I've seen this happen, uh, in my family, two different, uh, relatives and the car went out. I mean, the transmission went out while the other person was driving it. Now here's the thing. The transmit transmissions usually don't just go out. Like, it's been, it's, it's been moving towards that direction. Maybe the car has exceeded its mileage, or maybe the person hasn't maintained it, or some, something of that nature. But let's just say it goes out while you're driving. It has never caused them problems before. So they say, you broke my transmission. Now, they didn't tell you that the car got 350,000 miles on the car. And the transmission should have went out 280,000 miles prior. All they know is that the transmission has gone out, you're driving it, you feel really, really bad about it because it's broke down and it has broken down while you're out of state and the reason why you borrowed that car is because you don't have a car and you don't have financial means. So now the car is broken down and you can't even get it from where it broke down at. You can't even get it home. And it doesn't belong to you. Well, this is that situation. It doesn't even belong to this prophet. And he has no way to get it back. So therefore, he has to replace it with interest. Remember, if he had the means to buy his own, he would have bought his own in the first place. So here he is, and he has this dilemma. But he says, as he cries out, it was borrowed. The man of God, Elisha, said, where did it fall? That's the question he asked. Where did it fall? And he says, let me show you the place. Just show me the place. And what you're going to see here goes from the decision, I mean, from the dilemma to the decision, and you're going to see a deliverance because it says, it's right here. And so notice, notice, no, notice how Elisha responds. And not, Elisha responds like a great representative of God. This is how we're supposed to respond as believers. When we hear of a crisis or we know of a crisis, we're supposed to ask questions. And so when he says, uh, where did it fall? He says, and when he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there. Now notice this, he cut off a stick. He didn't use the current ax handle. He cut off a stick, he threw it in there, and I know this is not going to make sense to you. To some of you, I take that back. It's not gonna make sense to some of you all. It says when he threw it in there in the Jordan River, it says it made the iron float. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take this stool and I'm going to do something today for those who can't believe this. I'm going to explain what happened. Okay? 
Y- y- y'all with me? All right, now, listen, if, if, if you can accept the explanation that I'm giving you, it's going to make anything that takes place after what I explained to you make sense. You won't debate this. You won't debate, debate the marching around the, 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 the walls of Jericho until it collapses. You're not, you're not going to debate that. Listen, I promise you, you will not debate Jesus walking on water. You will not debate Bartimaeus and his friend, sight being restored. You will not debate uh, the, the, the woman with the issue of blood being healed. You won't. You will not debate it. You will not debate the man who was paralyzed, who was lowered through the roof by his friends and was restored, given his mobility. And he took up his own bed and said, I don't need you guys. I can carry my own bed from Haverty's. Listen, I'm telling you. Uh, uh, listen, in fact, when I read that about the guy carrying his bed, I said, man, this is really rooms to go. I mean, he's carrying his bed out. So, so listen, you won't debate any of this. And here we go. This makes sense, the iron floating, because I can't explain the molecules and all that. I, I can't do that. So, listen, some theologians, uh, uh, some philosophers believe that when they threw the stick in, the stick went into the water and it somehow went in the hole that was in the iron and it floated up. Makes no sense. Okay, here's the answer though. The answer is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. I promise you this. The answer is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you can receive and believe Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, anything else after that makes sense. And listen, I'm going to put my stool back because that's the science lesson I have for you. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, he created the heavens and the earth. If you can believe and receive that God created the heavens and the earth and all the content within the context of that, then anything else after that that he mentions, you should have no problem believing. So I move on. And so... You have this last piece. It says, when it floated up, Elisha said, take it up for yourself. Now, I'm going to stop right here. Remember, it floated up to the top of the water. If God wanted it to, it could have continued to float up in the air. All right? And it could have just landed at the feet of the prophet who had lost the axe head. But Elisha said, there it is, reach in there and take it yourself. In other words, God will do what you cannot do. And he will call upon you to do what you're supposed to do. Why? We are co-laborers with them. There are some things that the church can do that God has already authorized it to do. You can pray for someone without talking to God about, should I pray for someone? You can respond to someone who is in need. Listen, if you see someone who is destitute, someone who is disenfranchised, someone who is home, if you see them and you have the means to financially respond to them, whether it's $5 or $500, you do not have to run back to your life group, for those in the life group, you do not have to run back to the church family, if you're part of the church family, and say, I just ran into a man. He needed $5 to get something to eat. Well, you knew when you met him, you had $5 in your pocket. And you knew that you could have fed him. And you may, listen, if you're not careful, you say, well, I haven't eaten today. I haven't had lunch. But did you have breakfast? See, he may not have eaten for days. You can make it a meal without having one. Listen, you can skip a meal. You can skip a day 
Listen, we can skip several days, but he has not had anything to eat whatsoever. And so you could have pulled out that five dollars that you were saving for that Dunkin Donuts run or that Dunkin's run and could have got the brother or sister something to eat. Instead of running back to the church said, I saw someone sitting down. You don't have to pray about it. You don't have to talk to anyone. God has already given you the means to do something. And so when it comes to our part, you, listen, it's, it's the same. Work as if it all depends upon you. And pray as if it all depends upon God. The church does what it is supposed to do. And God blesses his or her effort. So when that iron head that from that axe, when it floated up, Elisha said, you reaching that, do something. I mean, first of all, you put it in there. Reach in there and grab it. And he, so he put his hand out and he took it. Listen, here's the thing. That axe head didn't mean a lot to a lot of people. We, we, we just got through talking about a head that goes on in the axe. Seems like such a small thing. But you know what it is? It's evidence that God even cares about the smallest things in you and my life. God knows about the condition and the needs of a sparrow. The Bible even says that he knows the numbers of the hairs on our head and that he cares to know. You and I don't care how much hair someone has on their head, but God says he knows he cares. God cares about the smallest of things in your and my life. Don't just take what you believe are the big things to God. Take it all to him in prayer. The Bible says be anxious for nothing. Listen, nothing. Nothing. Even the smallest of things. But by prayer and supplication, make your request known to God. Listen, the smallest of things. Listen, uh, Billy Graham once prayed this prayer. And there's a, Lord, help me to find my hat. That was his prayer. He had misplaced his hat. Lord, help me to find my hat. I didn't know about that prayer of his until I lost my hat. I have a hat that has been to every mission, uh, every country I've ever been to, to do mission. I put that same hat on. And one day, I misplaced that hat. And I remember being the ground, said, Lord, help me to find my hat. And I found my hat. And one day when we do mission work, you'll see me with my hat on. And if my hat is laying down, you pick it up and you give me my hat, so I don't have to say that prayer again. <laughs> but see, even in the smallest of things, seek God. Seek God. See, I'm telling you, seek God. Uh, and here's the deal. Just ask away. Just it, it, every single, single thing you can think of, go to God about. Every single thing. Ask God. Just talk to him. Talk to him. Put it before him. The small things, the large things that you consider small and large. Because God cares. I know it sounds weird, but I just explained to you from Genesis chapter 1 that God has a way of working through weird things and there are nothing but miracles to draw attention back to him. All eyes closed and heads bowed. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you have heard that he's died on the cross for you and my sins, and you believe that he rose on the third day, you believe that, you have faith in that, you trust it, and you seek to know more about him. I want to encourage you just to raise your hand above your head. If you want to know more about Jesus and how you can be saved, how you can have a relationship with him, a permanent relationship with him, then just raise your hand above your head. If you're not ready at this moment and you have questions, there is a card that is on the front of the seat that's on the back of the seat that's in front of you. If you would just take it and fill it out, 
give it to one of the uh, greeters as you leave today so that we can follow up with you because most importantly of all, we want people to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Father, our prayer is that today, if there's anyone that is contemplating Jesus Christ, we pray, Father, that you would just bring them to a place of peace where they can accept Christ with confidence. That they can, Father, just go to him and say, I surrender all. I admit that you are Lord and Savior. I believe in you and I confess you as Savior and Lord of my life. Lord, we just pray, Father, that that would be the prayer of someone who may be contemplating. That is our prayer. That's our desire. And we give it in Jesus' name. Amen.